Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for joining and, and coming to our webinar. It's Lynn and um, our, or Lynn and I's first webinar together. It's live, um, so they always say don't do live television with animals and children. So I think <laughs> Lynn and I are going to survive. Um, the webinar is going to last about 35, 40 minutes, and then we're going to have a Q and A um, at the end. If you're here for design sprints, build, test, and win in just five days, you're in the right place. Um, you're automatically muted, so we can actually hear you. But if you do want to ask questions, there should be a box on your uh, GoToWebinar um, portal there on your screen. You can ask questions. We're going to answer as many questions as we can at the end. Um, we'll get through those there. The webinar is also going to be recorded. So if there's anything that you think you missed or you want to take more notes on, we'll get this to you after the webinar. Um, so that's our housekeeping. On we go into introductions. So introductions. Firstly, Lynn and I are both with eCity Interactive. We are an agency that enables our clients to understand their customers' digital and marketing needs through research. Um, eCity is also part of a bigger media company. Center City Film and Video is our, our sister company, the largest film production company uh, in Philadelphia, and also Variant VR does the virtual reality work that we do. But we are the digital agency arm. We are the team that's doing a lot of that research with our clients. An introduction to myself, I'm one of the managing directors here, I run the client services and marketing team, and Lynn? I'm the director of UX strategy here at eCity Interactive, and very happy to be talking about design sprints. Sure, we're looking forward to spending this hour with you. So our agenda, um, four main things, we're going to talk about the importance of design and what actually design is, it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, we're then going to get into design sprints, what they actually are, how they work, um, the framework, and then the things that you need to consider, the pitfalls, what will make them successful, um, and then an opportunity to ask questions, learn more, and we'll, we'll point in the right, right direction for more material. So that's going to be our agenda. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're looking forward to getting through it. So the first first point is, anyway, is is what is design? I think if I asked 100 people what design was, you'd get 100 different answers. So I'm going to ask 101 people, Lynn, <laughs> what is design? So, yeah, I mean, it is a kind of a sticky question because the definition of design has broadened so much, um, particularly in recent years. I think when I was first doing this a long time ago, the common understanding was that it was visual design. So the fonts and the colors yeah. and the layout, et cetera. Um, but it's become much more than that. It's no longer just the domain of the designer either. It's become much more inclusive of broader teams and more close to strategy than to just aesthetics. So I guess that opens the next question of what is what does a modern designer look like? Mm. Who, are, who are designers then? Yeah, I mean, I think the broadest definition and kind of the point here is that if you're making stuff, right, be that a product, a device, or a service, then you have a process of designing that, right? Cool. So anyone who is making something, in essence, is a designer. I'm changing my title. I'm now a designer. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Moving forward. Um, and I guess that's the thing. It's like, you know, I would, you know, the, the initial reaction is it's UI. And right. It's how it's things apply. Right. It's, and it is, but it's also broader than yeah. that. You know, and it's, if you recognize the fact that you're in business to make something that people want, yeah. then you're a maker of things and therefore, on some level, a designer. The question is, you know, just how good of a designer are you? Cool. You put on your thing that the best designers are invisible. Yeah. That means designers aren't getting any credit, so maybe <laughs> I'm not a designer anymore. No, see, but, if everybody's a designer, right, okay. then, yeah, it, your product is going to be loved when the UI becomes invisible. Okay. And what I mean by that is if you're not having to think about how to use the product or the UI, then chances are it's a really solid design that allows the user to just stay totally focused on their objective. Cool. Give me an example. Cool. I always think about when you get an upgrade on your rental and you get the nice luxury car, yeah. and it's just such a joy to drive. It You don't have to think about driving. You don't have to think about anything except getting to your goal. So in a way, it's like a good UI is like a, a really nice car. Fantastic. So I guess then who's doing it and who's not <laughs> doing design? Like what? Yeah. I guess the first thing on this slide, and it's the thing, the reason startups fail We'll get into where that's, but let's get on the same page. What does a startup mean to you? Well, okay, so obviously the, the usual definition is yeah. a, a company that's starting up, and that's where this data came from. Yeah. 
But when I think of it, and I think of the, the roles I've had in the past, any project kickoff of note, so whether it's a new product that you're bringing to market or a critical new feature that you're implementing and planning for or um, any type of a, a readdressing a new market, um, those are all, in essence, like a startup kind of project because it's a bold, big, new initiative that you have to think carefully about how you're going to design and build. So things where there's unknowns, that's yeah. the thing. You know, a startup could be a project and a massive corporate where there's unknowns and you're trying to manage that process. Yeah, it's like you've got a problem, you know you have a problem and, and you have to figure out how to solve it. Now, what this slide is talking to, though, is a little different. This is talking about actual startups that failed. Yes. So this is a study done by CB Insights. And when I saw this, um, I mean, in one sense, it's like, wow, there's a lot of opportunity for UX folks out there. But in the other sense, it's like, uh, you know, 46% of these 101 startups that were surveyed yeah. said that the number one reason they failed is because they weren't addressing a market need. Yeah. <laughs> like no one wanted what they were making. And there was an interesting thing in that survey in the sense, like 40% wasn't the market need, 18% mm. was pricing cost issues, 14% was poor marketing, 14% was guessing what the customer wanted, 10% was pivot on bad. And these are all percentage, or these are all things that could have been helped by design sprints, design thinking. So mm -hmm. that's part of it. It's almost like 90%. Like design sprints, design thinking could have dealt with a multitude of things in products or services. Yeah, and I think when you think of design sprints and design thinking, um, the key element of that that would have helped these guys is user research, yeah. right? So not just asking your customers, you know, what they want in a market research sense, but also mm -hmm. observing their use of the product in context yeah. to identify unmet needs. That's that's also a, a big aspect of this as well. So that not being connected to your customers could certainly be addressed by that, sure. right? You mentioned research, and I'm always mm -hmm. interested by what's the difference between customer research, user research, market research. Right. Is it all the same, or? It's definitely not all the same. Okay. Um, and it's all necessary. Yeah. But in general, you know, market research is, you know, think about focus groups and survey data and MPS yeah. scores, that kind of thing, where you're, you're asking your customers what they want. Okay. And that's, there's a purpose for that. Yeah. Obviously, a place for that, very important. However... Um, user research does something else, and that's observing user behavior. So rather than asking you, Kevin, what you want to see on this, say, mobile application, yeah. I'm taking a prototype of that mobile application, I'm putting it in your hands, and I'm asking you to complete a series of tasks, Ooh. right? So then I'm going to see, like, what didn't work for you, what did, and be able to identify things that you didn't even know you needed, right? So that's how you innovate. It's invisible. Here's the thing. Let's talk about some of the benefits, then, of... Design, design thinking. Let's take a look. There's, there's four buckets here. Yeah. Which one stands out for you? The one that is the most obvious is product quality, right? And I think yeah. you know people that do UX, that's the first thing you're thinking about is you're continuously making the product better through iterative design and testing. Yeah. I think what people don't recognize perhaps is the cost savings and the revenue gains and the marketing positioning benefits that result as well. So cost savings is definitely impacted. Yeah. Having worked in software for a lot of years, um, imagine the difference between prototyping a design and testing it in a week and finding out it isn't good yeah. versus taking an entire release cycle, which, I mean, not all companies are agile at this point, right? Um, a lot of companies are still having six months to a year release cycles. Imagine going down the wrong road and yeah, what the yeah. cost of that would be. Yeah. So the, the cost savings can be significant. Yeah, we're getting into that ROI conversation. Yeah. We, we spoke about a lot about that before this webinar mm -hmm. because you know sometimes companies aren't great at, at, at benchmarking the ROI or getting that data, but that data is there. Yeah. And there's lots of data. You just need to know where to look or how to set it up. But yeah. the ROI is there. If you're looking, for example, to um, compel your, your senior management to make an investment in this, yeah. um, just a cursory Googling of UX ROI and you're going to get a ton of data. Yeah. And there's some really good infographics out there that kind of pull all the stats together. Um, but I know one that always comes to mind is from my time at IBM. Yeah. Um, there was a report that showed that every dollar invested in UX returns between 10 and $100. Yeah. I mean, these, these are impressive numbers, right? Yeah. So there's, it's definitely easy to make the case for, for UX. Okay, so if you could sum up design, you know, research, design thinking, mm -hmm. what's What's the summary? What's, how would you 
So it's all in my mind about um, rehearsing for the future, which is why I love this quote from yeah. Brian Carlin. So if you're not familiar with his name, um, he's a legendary designer, um, was at Ogilvy and Mather for years. And this quote gets right to the heart of it, I think, because design sprints allow you to take a peek into the future in the way I was just describing, right? So without having to invest in a lot of development, you can very quickly within one week learn if the designs that you come up with are going to fly or not. Yeah, yeah. there's a great line in that article that talks about competing with the future, competing for the future. Yes. And it's this idea that you know, companies or groups of people that are using design thinking or using design sprouts, they're, fine, they're, they're your competitors. You don't even know they exist. <laughs> You're competing with the future and someone who can meet the need of the customer faster than you. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting concept. I mean, we tend yeah. to think of competing with our competitors, obviously, right? But honestly, um, the future is coming so quickly and right. opportunities are so easily missed that you are, in, in essence, competing with the future. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. So we get on to design sprints themselves, mm. and this is a framework for this design thinking. So yeah. I guess the first thing is, how did you find this book? <laughs> so I, I had been following Jake a little bit online in 2015, and he had started blogging about this. Now, Jake Knapp is, is the author of Sprint, and uh, he actually published, I think it was 2016. Okay. And um, that's obviously the first time I read the book. And I had been wanting to sprint for a long time before I was actually able to, to compel the powers that be to allow me to do it. Yeah. Um, but the cool thing about design sprints is that you can explore really bold solutions to risky problems. And by that, I mean, even though you can sprint against any kind of problem in terms of a problem space, yeah. you really want to make sure that you're picking something that is high stakes yeah. um, and something that's really big. Okay. And that's the absolutely best scenario for this five-day engagement that we do on site with our clients. And it's a multidisciplinary team of like five to seven people. Okay. Optimally five participants and two facilitators. Okay. Um, but so, yeah. So just from a high level, it's a five-day sprint. Five-day sprint, time-boxed exercises. Your facilitators are going to walk you through a process that we'll, we'll go over next. Okay. And we're going to get into that in more detail mm -hmm. what the actual structure of the sprint, sprint is. So I guess... What kind of problems is the sprint trying to solve? Like yeah. What's... So a little background that is in the introduction yeah. of the book is probably helpful here. So um, Jake was talking about how he had been working with these product teams over the years at Google. They came from Microsoft, yeah. then he went to Google, and then ultimately Google Ventures. Yeah. But it was during his time at Google that he was challenged by someone on a team. He said, like, how do you know that these design sessions even work? You know, Because he was basically doing brainstorming sessions with sticky notes. You know, yeah. like pseudo design thinking, um, <laughs> and what you know this slide here shows is that brainstorming just does not work, right? It's it's a lot of uh, people in a room, but maybe only one or two of them are actually doing all the talking, and the rest of the folks in the room have untapped ideas, and perhaps the ones that are speaking are in conflict with each other, right? So although it's our first instinct when we're in groups solving problems to brainstorm and you know, a quantity of ideas over quality and throw it all up on sticky notes on the wall, that's really not the best way to go about. Cool. I think the yeah. psychology of brainstorming sometimes, you're right. It's like senior people in the room, <laughs> you know, consensus format, yeah. you know, some people not feeling that voice, and worse sometimes when the senior people in the room disagree. Yeah, and yeah. You create that perfect storm where everyone's I like... I can't tell you how many yeah. kickoff meetings or... Um, you know, uh, project kickoffs or product launches that I've been to that result in actually being more confused at the end than when you, when you started. So. Yeah. so design sprint, and this is the other thing, just you know, jumping back to, to Jake Knapp, it's the thing of, he worked for Google Ventures, he worked for Google, yeah. and he did, I mean, he, he became obsessed with the process and the exercises to get the best ideas. And really the design sprint was his framework of mm -hmm. having done this hundreds, hundreds of times be like, okay, it's the framework. This is what I find. Well, well, like when he first tried to come up with a better process, all he could observe from his own study yeah. of his own projects were the ones that were successful had a diverse team. So yeah. it wasn't just like a designer and a product person. And, yeah. you know, um, so it's a multidisciplinary team. And they had enough time so that they could each sort of um, come up with design ideas on their own, but not so much time as to have it devolve into one of these giant you know, critique and debate sessions that just yeah, spins yeah. out of control. So he decided to at least have those two attributes 
to the process that he came up with. But then, yeah, to your point, he worked with, I think it was like 140 or 150 yeah. startups at Google Ventures, and he just kept tuning the knobs on this thing. So he tried two weeks, he tried three days, he yeah. tried 10 people, 12 people, um, and it tweaked all the different exercises over time. Yeah. And, and guess, the guess, five days, what he's recommending is kind of the ultimate in cool. terms of, yeah. So the brainstorm timing's problem, I guess then in the sprint, mm. It, the exercises solve it with this critique process. It's, it's the constraints yeah. that make it work. So the facilitator of the design sprint is going to ensure that you do not spin off into debate, that you don't even have an opportunity to pitch your own ideas. It's uh, the best of all worlds in the sense that yeah. you get the maximum number of ideas generated by the team, but you're all sketching independently, right? And then you have what's called the speed critique, where those best idea summaries are put up on the wall. And then there's this process of silent voting using sticky dots wow. that creates a heat map. And then there's always a decider on the team. And that's the most senior person on the team who makes an authoritative final decision. So whenever a decision is made, yeah. it's done in this general format, right? That just keeps it from devolving into Fantastic. So we've got design thinking, good for business, Good for ROI. Mm -hmm. We've got a framework for enabling that design sprint, uh, design thinking, design sprint. Yep. Give Give me some live examples. Like what kind of other examples oh. could you design sprint? Online? And what, and this is where it's endless, right? Yeah. So um, you know you can really apply it to any problem space. It doesn't even have to be like a website or an app or or software as a service. It can be you can be solving a problem of uh, improving your recruitment processes. Yeah or solving a problem of attrition, or designing a physical space, right? So any problem is fine. These are just a few examples to show the diversity of what it can be applied to. And I won't read through them, you can see them on yeah. the screen, but you know, basically the idea is that um, you know, it's gonna be something meaty and something high stakes, yeah. um, but any problem space, really. Yeah, I think the thing that's really interesting is the companies that are using this, it, 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 it emanates through the whole business, but mm. it's your HR processes, your marketing, mm -hmm. Your, you know, it can it can solve lots of different problems, and then it jumps back to the ROI where we were talking about rehearsing for the future. You get there faster. Mm -hmm. So it was another thing why startups fail. That like we spoke about before. This is like, you know, companies doing this are getting their product out faster, the marketing out faster, everything's getting to market faster. You get outpaced. And it's inclusive. So you've got all the different functional areas of your business oftentimes represented in a sprint, which means. There's a shared understanding. Yeah. There's a spirit of innovation. And you know, you can see like our original discussion about what is design, just how much more strategic design has become, mm -hmm. right? You can't just leave it to designers alone. So you said big meaty problem. <laughs> yeah. How how big can they be? Like what? Like... So I guess, you know, and this is sometimes a question that we'll get, right? Because yeah. we're always saying the big high stakes problems are what you have to go after, but people will be like, Well, you've got a week. <laughs> How yeah. am I supposed to redesign my website in a week, like if that's my problem? And you know, the answer is you don't. But you know, you start with that big goal and the big problem, and then on day one, you're going to focus down on one manageable aspect of that problem that you can design and prototype and test in one week. Okay. So then, taking let, let's delve into the actual process. Then, so it's going to be a bit of state step change. Let's from from a high level. Mm -hmm. Just talk me through the five day sprint and sure. how that think and how the framework works. Yeah, okay. So Monday is all about um, defining the challenge. And we're gonna go into more depth on each one of yeah. these days, but basically you're setting a long term goal, you're identifying risks, and then you're drawing a map and choosing a target for the sprint. Then on Tuesday, this is all about um, generating diverging ideas. So you're gonna go through a four part sketch exercise and everyone is gonna end that day with their best idea expressed in a sketch that is anonymous and easily understood. And then Wednesday is when we go through the process, uh, similar to what I described earlier with the silent voting, yep. um, where the decider ultimately chooses what the target for the sprint is. And by that, I mean, what is the thing we're gonna prototype and test? Cool. Thursday is building that prototype. So it's a realistic prototype, but you're not gonna use the normal tools that you do. Like if you're building a website, you're not coding this thing in HTML and CSS and JavaScript. You're using PowerPoint or other smoke and mirrors methods to make it just realistic enough to get some really solid feedback. Yeah. 
And then on Friday, that's what you do. You test that with five actual customers. Get the results. Yeah, yeah. Or you get some impact. Great. So let's let's nail, let's go into more detail and let's unpack the Monday. You come with an ambitious but manageable piece of a big problem. Yeah. So you come with your big challenge, and I guess the first thing you want to do is to get kind of optimistic and say, why are we doing this? You know, yeah. <laughs> where is it that we want to be? What's our long-term goal? And um, after you do that, and I, I usually like writing it in the form of like who, what, and wow. So like who yeah. is it that we're trying to do something for? What is it that we're trying to do? And what is the real impact? What is it that is the market need here? Um, and then you identify risks and assumptions. So you kind of get negative and you say, okay, fast forward two years from now, if this didn't work, what went wrong? Okay. You know, what assumptions are we making that have to be true in order for us to meet our goal that could, you know, pose a risk? Um, and then uh, at the end of the morning, you map it out. And that's what this slide is showing. It's just a real high-level map with your different user types on the left, your goal on the right, and then five to ten steps in between. Okay. So when we've done design sprints, I, yeah. I, you know, I kind of have to stop myself deciding what I want the sprint to be before you turn up. Well, yeah, because, you know, you work in a digital agency, right? So that's <laughs> okay. going to be your problem is to always want to come to the table yeah. with a solution, yeah. But you, that's the thing, you don't. You, Absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, and what's cool is that even if you have that kind of problem-solving attitude because you're a creative person, yeah. the constraints of these exercises, the time box nature of them, and the facilitator is going to keep you from being able to go down that road. You are not solving a problem on day one. You are defining the problem space. So next question is, who <laughs> is defining that problem? We spoke about who's attending a little right. bit earlier, but mm -hmm. let's unpack that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Who's in the room? So um, oftentimes it'll be folks that are directly involved in the project and have a real interest in it, a vested interest. They'll be working on it or around it every day. And you definitely need to have a senior leader, at least one, maybe okay. two, to function in the role of authoritative decision maker. Okay. Um, and then, of course, facilitators who are going to walk the team through the exercises, right, like yeah. myself. Um, but it could be, and oftentimes is, a designer, a developer, a marketing person, a financial person. I mean, it, it totally depends on what the problem is. But you want a senior diversity. And they've got to give up a week. So it's got to, that's when you yeah. get it, but it's going to be that big problem. Right. If you pick something yeah. that is not significant, you're not going to get those folks, including that C-level exec or, or whomever, you know, to commit their time. So there's an opportunity for experts yes. in that day. Yes. So there's people that you think are outliers, but you want their input. Yep. You bring them in on Monday. You bring them in after lunch on Monday, exactly. And we call this Ask the Experts, right? Okay. So oftentimes we will get resistance from clients saying, oh, only five to seven people, but we really have like 12 people that need to be involved. Yep. Well, the way you solve that is to ask them to come in in the afternoon on Monday, review your map, your goal and your yeah. questions, and give their unique perspective. To, to the problem. So here's the other thing. I've got to fight not to decide what the problem is before <laughs> I come in. But one of the reasons is that you need the testers. Yeah. And my thing is then, no, I'll, I'll get my testers lined up the yeah, week yeah. before. <laughs> but if you've not defined the goal, yeah. so, I you got know, my wrong testers. True confessions, right? Like yeah. when we did our first internal sprint, we made that mistake because we were concerned that, oh my gosh, it's going to take so long yeah. to line up these five customers because you want to have backup people as well, yeah. right? And look, what if somebody gets sick? What if it's a snowstorm? So it just seemed like something we should move on right yeah. away. Well, you don't know who you're solving the problem for yeah. until the end of the day Monday. So if you come in on Monday with your list of customers, you've kind of defeated the purpose, right? Yeah. You're going to compromise the quality of the test yeah. sessions on Friday. So you can't start recruiting until at the earliest Tuesday morning. So you need the backup team to help you get Yeah. Answers. It doesn't have to be someone on the team yeah. that's doing that recruiting because it takes a couple hours a day if you're going to be doing it like on social media. Or, you know, if you have a real niche product that you're designing that has a real unique kind of user, you're going to have to go to your network, yeah. right? And that's fine. Uh, but if it's kind of a common user, like if you're doing an e-commerce shopping cart experience, for example, you can write a screener and recruit people on Craigslist. Yeah, yeah. cool. Okay, what's next? Um, so that's Monday. Yeah, so by the end of the day, Monday, now your decider has picked a target for the okay. sprint. So now we're going into Tuesday, which is the day that goes by the quickest, I think, for most folks, because you're spending the whole day sketching ideas. And there's this four-part sketch process that the facilitator will walk you through. 
and it's worth noting that no artistic talent whatsoever is required here. So don't, you know, clinch up if you're yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in a sprint and you can't draw a straight line. Like all you need to do is write words and boxes and arrows and just enough to get your concept across. Uh, but the day starts with demoing cool ideas yep. that everyone brings to the table. So this could be things that were on the cutting room floor from maybe you tried to solve this problem previously or just inspiration that you found online. But you're not speaking to anybody. You're doing this. Well, in the morning you are. Okay. You're demoing in the morning you are. So you okay. get each get a chance like for three minutes to demo these ideas that you found. Okay. While that's going on, I'm making sketches of each idea, okay. giving it a title or, and putting it up on the wall for reference for later. And once we get through those lightning demos, then it's time to start walking around the room, taking notes, gathering your inspiration, writing down some sketch ideas, whatever comes to mind. And then we're walked through a process of crazy eights where you take the best idea that you come up with and you do eight one-minute iterations on that. Of the one best idea. Of the one best idea. Yeah. So it's like, how can I do this a different way? How can I do this a different way? Yeah, and yeah. The, the timer rings every minute and it'll drive you crazy. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but that's the name. But um, what's not crazy about it is that how it helps you to come up with different ways of doing it. I totally agree with you. It's the time constraint that forces you to just create. Like, mm -hmm. don't have those inhibitions. Like, oh, I'm not sure if that's a good idea or that. I'm not sure. It's like, no, you just, just get it done because you've got to move fast. Yeah. The other thing I find interesting about this part of the process is you have to start discarding ideas. Yes. And that makes you focus as well. Because mm -hmm. if you've got three or four ideas and you're trying to, you've like, you know, you've got your one best one. That's what you've got to go with. Yeah, so discard is the right word to use in this context, but one thing I found too as a facilitator is that those things that end up on the cutting room floor, don't get rid of them. Yes. Because you don't yet know what the outcome of the sprint is going to be. So part of what the facilitator does is to document all of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay, next. Jump up to Wednesday. Yeah, so Wednesday now everyone has created their solution sketch, and these things are anonymous. Right? Yeah. You don't want to know whose idea is whose, right? Because then you've got the decider there and you're going to start influencing each other just the way you would in a brainstorm session with groupthink, right? Yeah. So each solution sketch that a person makes has to stay within one piece of paper. Okay. So it's got to be concise, okay. anonymous with a title, and it just describes the, the idea. It has to be completely self-explanatory because you as the designer don't identify yourself. The facilitator reads through the solution idea. Cool, so your solution sketch is coming from your best idea, yep. your crazy A, the one that you think is gonna, gonna work. Yep. And your solution, I mean, from a marketing point of view, we did it once for, it was like, okay, you come through a Google ad, you land on a landing page. Uh -huh. like, is that's the solution that you're sketching out. Yes, you're, you're, you're gonna try and come up with what you think the best idea is, and it can combine, obviously, a number of elements. Okay. Right, depending on what the problem is. And the example we see on the board here, people are using sticky notes to kind of break it up into a three part flow. Yeah. yeah. But the main point is that it be self explanatory because the facilitator has to be able to say, oh, this is what this idea is about. Here are the most important ideas that I see. Then everyone else on the team will point out anything I might have missed as facilitator. And it's only at the end of that three minutes that the creator says, yeah, but you missed this point if, you know, if there was something that was... So that's the thing, there's no conversation to this. No point. sales pitches. No sales, the internal yeah. salesperson that is me <laughs> has to sit there in silence. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I, that's the part that takes the psychology away from it. It allows the idea to play a you know, playing field. Exactly. Know, it's how you get the best ideas from everyone on the team. Imagine a brainstorming session in contrast. Yeah. Right? Someone would be pitching their idea right out of the gate. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this ensures that that cannot happen. Yeah, and you yeah. start getting those light bulb moments where you start getting ideas that you maybe didn't think of, mm -hmm. and start getting alignment there. Okay, so how do you how do you start this devolving into consensus? Ah, uh, so that's um, when one decides, and that's done with the heat map voting, and you can see the little sticky dots here on this yeah. page. But basically, um, it's a process wherein um, everyone kind of indicates with these little blue dots on the team what they think their best ideas are across the solution sketches. Yeah that ultimately that decision maker comes in and they have three dots they can use and they identify what it is that you're going to prototype and test. So it's their decision is authoritative and final, right? right? And it's made from a position of leadership, but it's informed by a heat map of the opinions of the team as a whole. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah, and there's times when ideas overlap and mm -hmm. can be grouped, mm -hmm. but you start to see a pattern of thinking. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so sometimes like you'll see 
it's one idea from this sketch and another idea from that sketch to get pulled together to create what you're going to actually okay. target and spin on. So the decision maker makes these decisions. Mm -hmm. We've got our target then. How do we get from here to prototype? So, yes, so this lovely piece of artwork. This looks a lot. <laughs> I can't, my artwork's not as good as this. Yeah, but see, you don't need to be an artist. Look at okay. this thing. So this is an example of a storyboard. So once you have defined what it is that you're going to create, then to your comment earlier about like, well, we, we picked an entry point, right? So we said, oh, okay, we're going to start off as if this person clicked on an email that was promoting yeah. something or they were in social media and clicked on a LinkedIn ad, whatever. You pick that entry point into the process. And then what you're doing here is each one of these boxes, you're just drawing a sketch of what the next step is, right? And so it gives you a sense of the flow and what it is that you're going to be prototyping on Thursday. So it gives you an idea of something how, well, here's the thing, we'll get onto the prototype mode. Mm -hmm. and my question is then how, how high fidelity, low fidelity mm -hmm. is it? I guess in the storyboard, you start getting ideas of like where, okay, we need an example of this or a high fidelity, the different parts you need to be. It's, but the big question is, how good does it have to be? Yeah, yeah. So, so one one more comment about storyboarding is is you got to be really careful at that point okay. not to start introducing new ideas. Okay. That's a risk, right? Yeah. So, what you're trying to do there is identify what copy needs to be written, what assets need to be gathered, what's the flow, because Thursday you're building this just real realistic enough prototype. Yeah. And I put this slide in the deck because it tries to get at that, and it's saying that the more time that you spend beyond that certain point. You're wasting your time. Your Absolutely. Yeah. This thing is not going to be fully functional, right? At the point that you've created your storyboard, you're going to have a sense of what the flow is, what the content is, what the images are, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so now you're going to do kind of a smoke and mirrors job of creating that prototype. If it's um, a web asset that you're building, or it, more than likely you're going to be using Keynote or PowerPoint or Envision, mm -hmm. just something where you can create a mock and have it be clickable, create a yeah. hotspot to go to the next page. Because once you've got your prototype on Thursday, you're then going to get into testing on Friday. Yep. Now, you've got a similar graph here where it's like, the number, like how much testing do you need to do? Yes. Like what? Yeah. And this people oftentimes will challenge, you go five customers, okay, like even if you get really good representative users, yeah. what is five people going to tell you? You know, it's a big, big market out there. But um, it's been shown uh, long ago uh, by Jacob Nielsen that if you um, use five participants in test sessions, yeah. you're going to uncover 75 to 80 percent of the issues with whatever it is you're testing. So that's that's what this graph is showing. That again, um, as with the fidelity of the prototype, there's diminishing returns when you go beyond five. You're doing a lot more work, and yeah. you're not getting a lot more data. And getting into sort of the ergonomics of it, because we've done this with our you know with our design sprint, you've got to get the room set up. Or <laughs> yeah. because if you get to Thursday and you're like, oh no, the camera's not working. Uh, yeah, but, these are the like, things that you learn on the road, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah so it, it's um you've got two rooms and and um it, you have to trust on on you know yeah. for us you have to trust that that your clients are, are getting the right room set up, right? You need a big honkin' sprint room with like a lot of whiteboard space, right? And that's where you're going to spend the majority of your time as a team during the week. But on Friday, um, one of your facilitators is going to be in a separate room with the participants, and um, we're going to be streaming back to the sprint room, the screen activity, the audio and the video of each participant as they're run through a test case that your facilitator will write yeah. um, during the course of the sprint that will exercise those sprint questions that you identified on Monday, those mm -hmm. risks. And to highlight that point, then, the script that you're testing, mm. you don't start that on Thursday night, your last minute homework. <laughs> Are you asking seriously if I do that? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, I do. Because the longer you wait to write it, the better it's going to be, right? Because yeah. as you're going through the design and the evaluation, okay. you're you're learning more and more about okay. the problem space, right? So honestly, yeah, your facilitator should probably wait. And because they've obviously been doing this stuff for a long time, they yeah. know how to write a test script, right? Okay. So it's quicker for them to do it than someone on the client team. You spoke about testers. Mm -hmm. What happens if someone cancels? Well, that's why you got to have backup. Okay. So you do. And worst case scenario, like we had a situation once where there was really bad weather, and the person that was late or that swatted to the time it just couldn't make it, and we didn't have anybody to backfill. When that happens, you can pull a representative mm -hmm. user from somewhere under your own roof. Um, better to have someone in the spot than no one, but the recruitment aspect of this is really important. But as I said, like the facilitator can help you with that, and 
it should be someone outside of the sprint team um, who works on it because it's, it takes a little bit of time. Yeah. We've, we've spoken about this a number of times as well. Do everything you can to get the five people. Yeah. Because the energy after this, like I'm again, <laughs> oh, I need to get a tester. So I have to wait till Monday. If someone doesn't turn up, I'll get some next week. No, no, no. But yeah. Do everything you can. Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is something that Jake identified when he was experimenting with the format. And yeah. he did try, like I said, like a, over the weekend, then you come back and analyze your results, and et cetera, or do the testing on Monday the next week. But you lose that juice. You yeah. just, um, there's something about doing this in a week. And at the end of the day on Friday now, you know one way or the other um, whether you have a successful idea or not or something in between. Well, you set it up. A winner every time. <laughs> yeah. So this a couple of outcomes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, and, and you've got to remember that, you know, people will be like, oh, well, what if, you know, what if the design tests really terribly? Yeah, and great. Fantastic. Because yeah. you just in one week saved yourself a year potentially or more yeah. of agony yeah. that depending on the um, high stakes nature of this problem, could actually be a death knell for your company, right? This potentially um, can really save you uh, enormous amount of headache. Um, conversely, if it's a good idea, great, then you've got a huge head start to yeah. where you would have been otherwise. Yeah. yeah. But most of the time, it's like kind of in between. So the basic idea is oftentimes validated, but you've gotten um, indications that there are things in your prototype that you need to tweak, right? And then retest. Yeah. And a lot of times that's what people do on their own after having been led through a sprint. They will make the obvious refinements once we, at the end of the day on Friday, go through and identify the key themes. They'll tweak their prototype and retest it again um, and sort of refine from there. Yeah. So that's a very common outcome. That, that's the great thing. It's like if you've done, if you go through the process, you're going to get a result. The result might be good or bad, but the mm -hmm. result is good for the business. Absolutely. But you mentioned we, throughout the whole sort of days, you mentioned facilitations and the facilitator. Yeah. And this is the this is the key to winning every time. I as a facilitator, yeah. I think so. <laughs> well, it is because there's there's a number of problems or things that can come up that yeah. are just can derail the process. Wrong problem, mm -hmm. wrong people in the room. Mm -hmm. Like, give me some of your insights. So. Well, if there's a lot of things that can go wrong, and and obviously the most um, fundamental one is choosing the wrong problem with the wrong team, yeah. right? Uh, so um, just an example on the team selection, um, a, a lot of times our instinct will be, oh, well, there's this one person who always has these ideas that are like really coming out of left field, and I don't want them involved, and they're going to want to be involved, and it's like that's exactly someone you do want to involve, yeah, yeah. because the process itself is going to account for that individual, and their outsider ideas might actually be revolutionary in a good way. Yeah. And if they're not, the team itself and the sprint process will correct for that, right? So those types of nuances, like you don't know, or until you do this for a while, you don't know how to course correct. Yeah. So you might have, say, um, a larger than usual sprint team because people didn't listen to you when you said five to seven, right? Yeah. So then you have to know that some of these exercises won't necessarily scale effectively, and you have to be able to on the fly compensate for that. But I think, honestly, the the biggest aspect of good facilitation is you, you absolutely have to have the confidence to <laughs> control the activities of some senior people for an entire week. So like if you're not cool with breaking up arguments and you're not cool with um, insisting that someone follow the process and trust in that process, then you're probably not going to be a very good yeah. friend facilitator, right? And that, that only comes with with the doing team, it. Yeah. I yeah. totally agree. And jumping back, like, what is the design sprint? It's a framework for design thinking, exercising. It's a playing field. But it's the rules and the process that make it really powerful. Yep. And having that referee or someone or the coach or someone to guide you, mm -hmm. and also the backup team yeah. to actually solve the problems in the design sprint that might come up, like mm -hmm. those testers or getting the script right or X, Y, Z. You need that coach to get your team. Yep. So positive experience. What are kind of the, what some of the feedback that you get from clients? So you know, overall the feedback we get is comes in two flavors. One is we never worked that way before, <laughs> yep. and and we never would have worked that way before. So I think people find uh, in general that it just fosters this um, this momentum, right? Yep. And this this um, shared vision happens because all the right people in the room 
they're working side by side, separately but together. Yeah. And for the first time, they're they're probably the most effective they've ever been as a team, which I know sounds like a whole lot of hoo-ha, but it's, I'm telling you it's the truth. Yeah, it I see it yeah. time and time again. And these quotes point to that. And I think the other thing that we hear a lot is um, we, you know, I'll ask, you know, how long would it have taken you to get to this point, you know, if you hadn't invested this week? And it's not at all uncommon to hear months or more. And oftentimes I'll say, we wouldn't have gotten here. Like, you know, with our traditional methods, it's hard to imagine how we would have gotten to the point that we're at. It's amazing how fast it moves. And from that creative process to getting the problem, getting the ideas, and then mm -hmm. the testing at the end, it gives you data mm -hmm. and takes the opinion out of it. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's something I meant to mention earlier and didn't, and that is that, you know, I think businesses are increasingly understanding what design is. Yeah. Right, and how strategic it is, and that more and more it's not just the domain of the designer, but understandably they're struggling in terms of how to make those first steps. Like, mm -hmm. how do we not just rely upon a UXer on staff, yeah. <laughs> right, to, to be that person that somehow makes our, you know, makes magic sauce and, and makes yeah. our product great? How do we as a team get involved? And a design sprint is like a massive shot of design thinking in one week. And by the time you get through your first one as a participant, you, you so obvious what the value is to that. And totally. people can actually change how they think and work as a result of it going I, forward. I totally agree with you. And even personally, I have the impact where now everyone's a designer. Mm. This then starts giving you the framework to allow you to do that. Even though it might not have been your career, it might not have been where you're from, but you're creating new processes, you're impacting the business. Yep. And this, this gives you the direction. So key takeaways. Well, the rehearse for the future. I mean, yeah. I think you know it's it's a great way to do that in one week with a really big gnarly problem, and um, it's safe. You know, so yeah. you it, the one mistake you definitely don't want to do is to pick a problem that doesn't matter, because then a design sprint is going to feel like an overkill for you, right? But you pick the right bold solution. Your facilitator will help you do that, and uh, at the end, you always win. Either it's a very efficient failure, or you are way down the road ahead of where you normally would be. Awesome. Okay. Um, we're jumping into Q&A. Uh, let me get some of the questions. Yeah, so we have to figure out how these have been curated okay, here. Let me, let me see if I can read them. And you, you mentioned up front, right, that we're going to, for anything we don't get to, we'll send out an email. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll try and get an answer to any questions anybody entered in. Uh, questions are, let me just find them. Okay, here we go. You mentioned Jake recommends a five-day sprint. Can you des design sprint in less time? <laughs> okay, so everyone wants to know that, right? Because like a week is a long time. And until you go through it, you don't get that it's the perfect duration. But the answer is that you can. Um, it's just if you wanted to do it by the book, it would be a five-day sprint. But you can, I mean, if you have a really good understanding of the problem space, and maybe you already have some solution ideas, they just aren't field tested, yeah. then you can condense you know, the first couple of days and focus more on prototyping and testing. So it's not impossible to kind of shuffle things around, um, but it really depends on, on how much background of the problem space understanding you have yeah. and you know, how many solution ideas you, you have at the ready. Cool. Next question here. And does the whole team need to intend for the entire entire week? Does the, does your team need to be yeah, there for the I mean, five days? You have to dedicate yourself to it. Again, this goes yeah. back to the problem, right? So <laughs> if people aren't going to have as much of a challenge dedicating their time and blocking off their calendar yeah. if they know that this is a really meaty problem. The one exception to the everyone has to be there is the, the decider. Okay. Um, and that kind of helps a lot actually because they're usually the most senior person and probably have yeah. the most demand on their time. Um, they do need to be there at three critical points throughout the process. So when you're picking the target for your sprint on Monday, you're deciding like what it is that the problem is that you're going to solve. And then when you're picking the best solution sketch, they need to be there. And they should be there at some point on Friday to actually see yeah. the findings from the testing, right? Um, but they can appoint a, sort of a delegate to act in their behalf, and that person has, you know, full autonomy to act for them in their absence. So that's the thing, like people. It's a it's a full week. 
getting the commitment, yeah. mobile phones, emails down. Oh, yeah. And that's, I'll tell you, that goes back to having a facilitator that yeah. is comfortable doing that, right? Now, of course, you know, the phone calls happen, yeah. the texts happen, people are, are doing business. So the only rule is just take it out of the room. Um, you know, you really have to be kind of um, vigilant about that or it compromises the sprint quality overall for everybody, right? Cool. We've got a question here. Can you sprint on non-digital topics like physical products? Yeah, we kind of talked about that already in the beginning, but quickly. So, yeah, you can definitely, like in the book, um, there's an uh, example of a company called Savio that yeah. <laughs> I really want to stay in a hotel that has this. They they made a robot that delivers what you are missing, what you forgot to bring, like yeah. your toothbrush or whatever, to your room. So um, that's used as an example continuously throughout the book, which is cool. Um, so, yeah, it can absolutely be a physical device. And in terms of prototyping, you know, you can do um, 3D printing. Um, you know, you can mock something up. You can carve something up. It could even be like a physical space. Yeah. Like you could, you know, with cardboard, you could even mock out the workflow of a cafeteria. I mean, it could be anything. Yeah. Yeah. So the problem, space isn't isn't an issue. Yeah. Right? It's it's the nature of the problem in terms of its, it's impact uh, to your business. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. Yeah. So we've got another thing. You covered this slightly. It's like, what, what if the users hate your prototype? Which I guess is always fear. I guess there's two things. Like, hate, you always have to fear that they're going to hate your prototype because it's not good enough, fidelity yeah. wise. Right. Or they're going to hate your prototype because it's not a good idea. Right. So that's why the it's important to do, and it's hard to explain this, you know, like uh, over a webinar, but getting that just right, just realistic enough is important. You want it to be just realistic enough so that you're observing their authentic behavior, that they forget that they're looking at a prototype. Even though you tell them up front, hey, yeah. this is a prototype and not everything's going to work, you want them to kind of lose themselves in it. And as the facilitator is asking them questions about it or where would you click to do this, they forget that it's a prototype, yeah. right? So, um, but yeah, if, I think the question asked was if the reactions to the prototype mm. are just, they don't like it, mm. finding a lot of issues with it. Again, that's a winner every time. I don't know if that thing where you think people forget. Do you think that when you speak to people that are more in tune with design thinking or UX, do they behave differently in the testing, or mm -hmm. do you, or like do you find do you find that people that maybe don't know what they're coming into and are just open? Like, how do you get past that? Oh, that's that's just the skill of conducting the session, right? Mm -hmm. So so uh, like you will have people that are um, they get stage fright a little okay. bit, or they'll get um, they're just more closed lip by nature. Yeah. So as a facilitator, you have to know how to draw the information out of those folks. And conversely, you can have people that just want to talk about, you know, their next vacation and like you have to yeah. focus them back down to the task at hand. So yeah, that's just all part of running the sessions. Okay, last question then. Those people, how do you recruit them? How how do we Oh, okay. How do you find them? So, I think we we touched on this yeah. a little bit too. So, um if if you're doing a website or something where it's a very common type of user. You can do Craigslist. I honestly haven't done a whole lot of this, but it is surprising how effective it can be to do online recruitment just with a web screener survey and, you know, an add on, a generic add on Craigslist, right? And he, yep. in the book, this, this, this process is described. I've always historically, working in software, worked on more like esoteric projects where you have this deeply technical user who is not like your everyday kind of person. And for those users and products, um, you're going to want to go to your network and, you know, talk to your client services people, your sales team, your, you know, field folks, and get some names. And honestly, um, that does nothing is better at engendering trust yeah, than yeah. involving your customers as design partners. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity. If there's anyone on the call who is in software as a business, um, this this type of process regularly involving your customers is just fantastic for your business. Cool. That's our last question. Um, that went by so fast. I know. <laughs> we're done. Um, we've only scratched the surface. One of the things that we did when we were putting this webinar together, we probably came up with three or four other ideas to do other webinars. Mm. Things that we can go into a deeper dive, whether that's ROI yeah. or so. Hopefully, this is going to be the first of many. Yes. Um, but if you'd like to learn, learn more, please email me. Uh, my email is there, kren at isainteractive.com, uh, or give us a call. Happy to give you more information. 
talk you through how you can get design sprints or design thinking into your business mm -hmm. and the first steps. And um, yeah, looking forward to, to tackling some of those big problems with you. Thank you, Lynn, for your time and effort. Thank you, Kevin, Thank you for your great it. questions. <laughs> and, um, yeah, we'll look forward to speaking to you in the future.